Okay, welcome to the uh, talk today, guys. We're gonna go for about an hour. I'll spend about 20, 25 minutes going through this infographic. And again, if you want to get a copy of it, you're welcome to download it from our website. The link is um, in the chat window there. I'll just put it, paste it back in there again so you guys can take a look at it. Um, please feel free to share this with anybody that uh, will benefit from it. Um, and so there's a PNG, but I, there should also be uh, the ability to download the PDF as well. Okay, so I put together this infographic called Rainwater Harvesting Anatomy of a Rain Tank because if you can get most of what's on this image correct, you're going to succeed at rainwater harvesting. And so rainwater harvesting is really important. I mean, right now, just in terms of current events, um, Cape Town in South Africa has literally um, around, I think it's 80 days of water left. Now, they have not had any rainwater, so you might be wondering, how is it that having rain tanks set up would actually help with um, you know, their water crisis? But what's really interesting is that when people start harvesting rainwater in cities like Cape Town, you can end up... <clears throat> Um, having uh, a lot less draw on the primary reservoirs. And so when you do end up with a three, four, five year drought, the situation does not have to get as bad as it has now because the amount of water that's being drawn from um, these massive reservoirs is dramatically reduced. Um, one of the most interesting case studies of recent years is the 2007 uh, droughts in Brisbane, Australia. They were literally, literally six months away from um, running out of water. All right, so um, coming back to the Brisbane example, they were literally six months away from running out of water. And the um, luckily some rains came. And as a result of that, they really got serious about rainwater harvesting to the point where they were no longer allowed to irrigate their properties with rainwater. Um, and a whole bunch of additional uses were allowed essentially. Um, thus reducing the amount of strain on the municipal system. Australia is an interesting country because they have um, a long history of rainwater harvesting. I mean, basically everything in that country can kill you. Um, when the Europeans came to Australia, they couldn't figure out how the Aborigines were surviving um, with almost no, no equipment. Um, and so it's a really harsh country from a survival perspective. And so it just became part of the culture in Australia to harvest rainwater and to sort out um, uh, water systems by these decentralized mechanisms. And so there's a lot of intelligence that you can gather from um, Australia. And, uh, and so I'd recommend that you guys check out some of those case studies. Anyways, after these floods in 2007, the result was that Brisbane ended up um, installing massive numbers of these rain tanks, which dramatically reduced the demand on the municipal systems, but it also created the resilience, increased resilience throughout the, um, the city. And so we can learn from those examples. Now let's go through some of the site components or system components that are required specifically in a rain tank. Now obviously to harvest rainwater, you need to have a good roof. And it's really important that that roof is made out of a hard surface, preferably enameled steel, or galvalume, um, which is a galvanized aluminum alloy. Or uh, in Australia, even, there are potable rated surfaces, which um, I have not found thus far in North America. Um, so your best bet is, again, aluminized, or sorry, uh, uh, enameled metal, um, galvalume, and even galvanized metal can work. Um, we generally want to stay away from asphalt shingles. Um, you can use them, but if you are going to use them, you have to be careful that they have not been impregnated with um, fungicides or other pesticides or herbicides that are going to prevent um, things from living on them because essentially those chemicals are going to end up in your garden, essentially. So if you do have asphalt shingles, it's something to think about. Um, but a roof is very important, preferably a hard surface. Um, one other little thing I'll say about the roof is that you generally want to make sure that if you are going to use a metal roof, I, I, the only product that I recommend is something called standing seam or roofs that have similar characteristics to standing seam roofs. So these are metal roofs where the fasteners are actually uh, concealed. So they're not exposed to the rain and you don't have to rely on a gasket underneath the screw in order to prevent water from getting into your house. 
Um, the next thing that's really important, especially if you live in a cold climate, is a diverter valve. And so we have this on all of our systems. These diverter valves basically allow us to send water to the rain tanks in the summertime or during the rainy season, and then divert it away during the winter. This prevents the tanks from freezing and all the other infrastructure from freezing as well. Um, you can harvest rain in the wintertime, although it's not probably going to be rain, it's going to be snow. Um, but it adds a bit of complexity to the system. So if you live in a climate where you get a lot of snow, um, then you may want to consider how you're going to go about harvesting that rainwater. The next really important piece of equipment is the, um, after this diverter valve right here, is actually the rain head. And so a rain head is one of the most crucial elements for pre-filtration of any rain head. Um, and so there's a company out of Australia that builds these called Rainwater Pty, I believe. And they're not that expensive. They're about 80 bucks. And they're basically there to uh, eliminate most of the large debris. So they have a stainless steel screen on them. They're self-cleaning. Uh, and they keep a lot of the big stuff out of the tank. Um, they're, like I said, they're incredible, low-tech, and they work really well. Um, the next piece underneath the rain head is actually the first flush diverter. And so this thing is sized based on the size of your roof and is gonna divert a specific amount of volume away from the roof um, at the front end of a rainstorm. So what that does is it takes the dirtiest water off of the roof and makes sure that it doesn't get into the tank. And so you can change the amount of water that's diverted based on the size of pipe and the length of pipe that you put down here. And again, the same company that makes these rain heads also builds a first flush diversion kit, which makes it really simple to use. It's really important that the first flush diversion has a drainage line going somewhere that, that the water, the dirty water that comes out of it can be put to productive use. And the caution that I'll give with these first flush diverters is that if you're not the type of person to do regular maintenance, I recommend you stay away from them. Um, these first flush diverters do actually divert dirty water away from your rain tank, so they work in that regard. But they have a little uh, mechanical filter at the bottom, which is basically just a screen and the screen does fill up with debris. And so if you're not cleaning this out on a regular basis, then this column will stay full of water, it will go septic, and it will actually be detrimental to the health of your rain tank. So something to keep in mind. Um, now, you'll notice that on the diversion valve, I've also got a vertical downspout. It's important that for winter, um, for winter thaw, you have the ability to take that water away from your foundation. It's amazing how many houses just drop the water off of their roof right down at the foundation. And that's a great way to damage your basement or your foundation. So make sure that surplus water that you're not using is being pushed away from the house and being put to productive use in a rain garden or something else or a soil potentially. Um, okay, so do not disturb the anaerobic sediment layer. So what's really important is a sediment layer actually, um, interestingly enough, is a very important part of the treatment train within the rain tank. So there's a really interesting research paper that I can uh, share with you guys here once we get to Q&A um, from a professor in Australia called Professor Coombs, who did a ton of research with some of his PhD students on both biofilms that form on the inside of rain tanks as well as the sediment that forms at the bottom of the tank. Now, these sediments and biofilms have been shown to be part of what's called an ancillary or additional kind of um, incidental treatment train. And what I mean by that is that they've now proven that the sludge at the bottom of this tank and the biofilms, the, the slime on the side of the tanks, is actually hyperaccumulating heavy metals. This is unbelievable, and it's actually totally believable. It's totally amazing that inside of the tanks, these biofilms are actually pulling heavy metals. And in the paper, they talk about the fact that these biofilms are pulling out lead, they're pulling out cadmium, they're pulling out aluminum. Um, and they actually even uh, studied to see what the difference in accumulation was between the column of water on the inside of the tank versus the biofilms on the outside. Amazing stuff. Um, so basically, you want your water to sit in this tank for a period of time. And what they found was that the hyperaccumulation happened for about two, three, four weeks. Um, and I'm sure that it continues to happen, but probably at a much lower rate. So this is part of the cleaning mechanism that goes on to clean the rainwater before you actually use it. 
So because of that, we don't want that sludge layer to be disturbed. And so you'll notice that when the water goes into the tank, and I'll just zoom in here a little bit, we've got this T with two little diversions right here. Okay, so the water, when the water comes in from the roof, it's actually gonna get pushed up through the tank, which removes any energy that that water has and makes sure that this sediment layer on the bottom is not disturbed. So a very important little piece of information, we call this a quiet inlet, okay? So a proper, um, so we wanna make sure too, next, the next thing is that we have a proper foundation underneath our tank. So foundations are very, very important. And what that means is that we're removing all the topsoil below the tank, because topsoil is not a good foundation material. And we're replacing this with material that's non-compactable. Um, and so that can be gravel or it can even be concrete, depending on how much money or energy you want to put into the foundation of a tank. It's really important to remember that tanks are super heavy. Water is really, really, really heavy. And so we want to make sure it's properly supported. If it's not, it could actually end up damaging your house um, if the tank actually falls into the house. So very important. The overflow of the tank is also really important. You'll notice if we zoom in here, that the overflow has a 45 degree angle right at the surface. So it's actually gonna skim off any debris coming out of the top of the tank. And again, we wanna make sure that the overflow is properly sent away from the tank so it's not gonna compromise the foundation. On the end of this overflow, we wanna make sure that there's some sort of a, a bug screen. Um, there's actually products that you can get off the market, um, available right off the, off the shelf that prevent rodents and bugs from climbing up these pipes and ending up in your tank. It's very important. We don't want this to become a mosquito breeding ground and we don't want rodents living in the water there or dying in the water for that matter. The tank itself should have um, an air inlet and outlet. So as the water level goes up and down, we have the ability to allow water in and out. And we should also have a, an outlet. And there's a couple of different ways to set up the, the access point for the water. The simplest is just to have a little pipe right here that takes water from a slightly higher water column than the bottom portion of the water. Generally, the rule of thumb is about 100 to 200 millimeters off the bottom of the tank. So we don't wanna draw the lowest water because that's gonna be the dirtiest water. The other way that we can do this is to actually set up a flexible hose um, that draws water from the center of the column. And the way that this works is a flexible hose will have a filter on the end of it and a buoy that floats on the top surface. So as the water level goes down, the water being drawn out of the, um, the water being drawn out of the tank is always come, coming from the central column. So another interesting um, way of pulling water out. Um, the tank itself should not allow light through the walls to prevent algae growth. So we wanna make sure that the material is opaque and we would really like to have a level gauge on our tanks as well. Um, it's one of the interesting things that happens when people start to harvest rainwater is that they start to be more conscientious of their water use. We've found this through all of the systems that we've designed, whether they're solar, solar photovoltaic, solar thermal heating systems, rainwater systems, when people have their own supply, their own decentralized access to water or energy, they become much more conscientious of the way that they're working within that system. So they generally will reduce the amount of water that they use or they'll reduce the amount of energy that they're using because they've got feedback. And I think this fundamentally explains um, one of my philosophies that humans are not inherently destructive. We just don't have enough feedback in our lives. And so when we design these feedback mechanisms into the system, our behaviors change. So the best way, in my opinion, to get people to change is to actually bring these systems into their lives. And um, the change will happen naturally. We never have to guilt people into doing anything. Um, guilt is one of the worst ways to get people to change how they are currently living their lives. These types of systems are one of the most effective. So just fi some final thoughts on this, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Um, while the rainwater that you capture using these ideas may be very clean and appropriate for irrigation, using it as a potable water so, uh, source will require you to do some due diligence on the pollutant sources around you as well as the water that you end up catching. So I highly recommend testing the water for pathogens, PhD, oh, sorry, pH, <laughs> PhD, pH, 
heavy metals, herbicides, and pesticides um, to make sure that if you do intend on drinking it, that it is clean. Most of these can be dealt with um, with filters. So carbon filters are really effective at cleaning rainwater and they'll remove a lot of the herbicides and pesticides. Um, UV light is a great way of making sure that there's no pathogens. Uh, and then you may need to use uh, KDF media or other types of filters to remove heavy metals from the system. Um, at the bottom of the infographic, you'll find URLs that you guys can click on. These will link to other pages on our website that you can go and gather information from. So hopefully you found this interesting, guys. I'm going to open it up for Q&A now. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them on specific rainwater harvesting topics. Um, feel free to uh, put your questions up in the comment section right now, and I will uh, address them as they come up. While we're waiting for questions to come up, if you guys uh, found this interesting and valuable, please hit the like button down below, the thumbs up. Uh, it's really helpful for the channel to make sure that it tracks. And um, so if you guys would like to have the information on the biofilms and what's happening inside of the rain tank and how it's hyper accumulating heavy metals, um, that's the article that I recommend checking out. Okay, so Kona asks, Rob, do you know of regulations? Um, uh, regulations there are using rainwater for non-potable use like, so Kona, I'm not sure if this is what you're saying or are you suggesting or are you asking whether or not we can use rainwater for irrigating vegetable gardens? If you can just clarify that. Um, and I'm not sure if you're referring to Alberta or not, but I will just answer it assuming that. Uh, here, in, here, in Alberta, we're allowed to use rainwater for subsurface irrigation and toilet flushing. Um, I should say that in the United States and Canada, CSA, which is the Canadian Standards Association, as well as the National, uh, sorry, NSF, which is the National Standards Foundation in the United States, are creating a co or joint rainwater harvesting standard that will allow um, and provide information and guidance for rainwater use um, for all uses, depending on how your local municipality or regulatory authority is going to interpret that. So um, rainwater will become a much larger area of um, opportunity and we'll be able to use it for much more than just subsurface irrigation and toilet flushing, hopefully pretty soon. Um, with all of the droughts happening everywhere, uh, rainwater I think is gonna be one of the largest industries going forward uh, in the next decade or two. Uh, Frank, you asked, um, interesting, will one tank be sufficient or how many do you need to install? So that's a really good question, Frankie, and it's not an easy one to answer, unfortunately. In order to figure out how much rainwater you have to store, you actually have to do a pretty substantial rainwater harvesting calculation. It's what we refer to as an optimization. And essentially what you're doing is you're trying to match how much water you can get off of the roof, uh, how much water you're using, so supply and demand, and then you're using um, a calculation to figure out um, how big the tank has to be to bridge between supply and demand. Now the good news is, is that we have a rainwater harvesting calculator that will be for sale on our website probably in about a month from now. And so I'll make sure that I announce that to YouTube. And that makes the calculation a lot easier. And so we've created our own process to figure out how to um, get the smallest tank possible to meet your goals. And the reason we want to go with the smallest tank is that the, the tank itself is probably one of the more expensive components that you're going to need. Now, Frank, you said you're in Michigan, which means that you guys get a lot of rain there compared to what we get out here. And so you're going to be able to get away with a much smaller tank than we will out here in Alberta. Um, so keep an eye out for that calculator and that will help you to figure out uh, how much rainwater you're actually going to have to store in tanks. Um, so Kona for regulations and bylaw in Calgary. <clears throat> so there's nothing saying that you can't harvest rainwater, uh, even in the bylaw, you just need to do it properly and safely. So, and, and to be honest, there's nobody really regulating rainwater harvesting in Calgary. So I would suggest you go ahead and do it. Follow some of the uh, guidelines that we've talked about here in this infographic. Josh, I've heard a lot about these systems not really being real world applicable and that ponds and pools should be the water collection systems. 
I'm not sure why they wouldn't be real world applicable. Um, I think that when you start getting into really large requirements for water, for example, if you're hydrating livestock with it, we're not going to be using rain tanks for that, Josh. That's when you're probably hinting or what you're hinting at. Uh, that's when we use dugouts and ponds uh, to store massive amounts of water because they're far cheaper than trying to store water in rain tanks. Um, coming from, I believe you're in uh, Montana, you're going to have similar cold climate requirements to ours. Um, and so if you want year round water from the rain, you're going to have to store it underground in underground cisterns. The um, drawing that I have in front of you guys right now is for an above ground tank, but a lot of the same components are going to exist in below ground tanks as well. So we have different types of rain storage depending on the scale and the application. That's really important to keep that in mind. But they absolutely are applicable in real world scenarios and we will be seeing a lot more rain tanks in the future. Uh, Nando Dando, uh, if heavy metals need to settle out in a film, what's the ideal way to get uh, nearly pure water from a barrel project? Sand, rocks first or removing heavy metal deposits from settling, pure as possible. Um, so by barrel project, can you elaborate on that? Are you referring to small rainwater barrels as opposed to large rainwater tanks? A um, couple of things there. If, if you're using more barrels, so uh, smaller vessels, more smaller vessels, you're actually going to have more surface area to volume in that system, which means that if you have more surface area, you're actually going to have more biofilm, which will bioaccumulate the heavy metals that we're speaking of. So from that regard, it will be better. Um, however, putting lots and lots of small tanks together tends to be more expensive because um, you've got lots of plumbing fittings. Plumbing fittings are really expensive. And when you have to start piping everything together, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy. You've got to design it to be freeze thaw proof. So it has to be drainable. Um, so something to, to think about. Generally speaking, I say that the, those blue rain barrels are um, they used to be the bane of my existence, but I've re since realized that they're actually the gateway drug to much larger rainwater harvesting systems. Because when you put a small barrel down, what people realize is that a, a super tiny rain will fill them up. And so uh, once they realize how fast they fill up from their roof, then they realize they got to go bigger. So it's just the gateway drug. Um, okay, so next one. Depends on your design, I'm assuming. Absolutely, Frankie, it totally depends on your design. So Darla, thank you for the information and the infographic. I appreciate the work you do in sharing this info with the public. No problem, Darla, really appreciate it. <clears throat> Frankie, thanks, Rob. Kona, great, thanks. And lastly, Frankie Robertson. Thus far, I discovered my house is working again. Uh, vinyl and asphalt roof, name the type of roof again, um, and metal isn't sufficient. Okay, totally. <clears throat> So let's just bring up an image here and I will share it with you guys uh, so that you guys can see what it is that I'm talking about. So the type of roof that you want is called standing seam. And so let's just go look at some images of standing seam so you get an idea. So you see in this roof here, all of these ridge lines right here are actually covering uh, fasteners. And so you can't actually see the fasteners underneath the standing seam roof. Let me see if I can get a better image of this. So in a standing seam roof, the fastener is actually covered because the next panel actually clips into the first panel. Um, and that's the brilliant part about this type of a metal roof. If we look at a conventional metal roof, most metal roofs look like this where they have exposed fasteners. So these fasteners, uh, have little gaskets on them. So let's look at metal roof. Fasteners. And what you'll notice right here, and I'll just zoom in, is that, let's see if we can get a better image, that they've got these rubber gaskets underneath it. Okay, and so these rubber gaskets actually get really hot in the sun. They bake. And then over time, what happens is that because you've created a hole through your roofing material, <clears throat> this rubber gasket will break down over time and then this becomes a potential leak location. So this is why I'm not a big fan of um, rubber gasketed screws. 
And the only real solution to it to hold the metal tin down is to use a type of metal where the screw is no longer exposed, which is why I recommend standing seam. Now there are many of different types of standing seam. These roofs come in different brands. And so you don't necessarily have to go with an actual standing seam roof itself. So do a little bit of research to figure out what works for you. Javin, nice to see you on the live cast there. Hey Rob, thanks for the live session. In Victoria, we had a half back held barrel that we used solely for water, wash water and had a, a pipe that came right to the washer. Appropriate design for use, thanks. Awesome. Um, okay, next question. I have a metal roof, but it is not standing seam. Does this mean I shouldn't collect water from it? Kathy, you can still collect water from a regular metal roof. You just need to be cautious that the fasteners are not um, uh, degrading, I guess, and or have degraded, I should say, um, and that they're creating a leak hazard. So one thing that you can do is get up into your attic once in a while and just see if there's any water marks on the underside of your roof decking to see if the fasteners have, or the, the, um, the gaskets have basically released. You can also get up on the roof if you're careful and take a couple of them out and just look at what the rubber gasket looks like. Uh, it's really important um, to do that on a, on a regular basis. The, the thing that's crazy about these metal roofs is that they have, um, the, ga the gaskets on these fasteners claim to have about a five year lifespan on them. And so the solution to that is to go back up and replace all the fasteners. But we're talking about literally thousands of fasteners on an average roof. And not only is it just a matter of replacing the fasteners, but you actually have to continually increase the size of the fastener every time you replace it. So the next time you put a new fastener in, it has to be a, a wider diameter screw. It's got to be, um, because otherwise you won't get a good seal and there's no guarantee that it's actually gonna hold on to the plywood underneath it. And so eventually you won't be able to get fasteners big enough and you just have to replace the whole roof. Whereas if you just put a standing seam roof on in the first place, it's a lifetime roof. It's never going to have to be replaced. A lot of them can be repainted if they need to be. Um, although if it's a properly uh, baked aluminum roof, then you should be fine. Um, and just another thing to think about when you're thinking about putting on a roof, we want to always be thinking about ways to stack functions in permaculture. So we want to try and find multiple ways to use those, the resource that we're investing onto our, our property. And so I'm actually really a big fan of white roof, uh, roof, roofing that is of white material. And the reason for choosing a white roof or a reflective roof even, so stainless steel is another roofing material that is starting to gain popularity is that it reflects solar energy away from the house, which is gonna reduce your cooling load. So if you live in a place where there's lots of air conditioning, we can have a roof that harvests rainwater that reflects energy from the building to reduce the cooling load. And then if we use solar thermal collectors like these ones, I'll just show you an example. These evacuated tube collectors, like these that get mounted to the roof, you can also mount them up from the roof as well. Um, here's another great image. See if I can find another good one. So we'll just use this one right here because it kind of illustrates what I'm after here. So these evacuated tube collectors, they collect solar thermal energy and they heat hot water, you can use them for space heating. We use them in quite a few of our projects. You can imagine that if you've got these tubes mounted on your roof and the roof behind it is white, you're actually going to get solar energy coming in from the backside as well. So as the solar energy goes through the spaces in between the pipes, we're actually going to get solar energy coming from both sides. It's kind of like the same as when you go out canoeing and you get sunburnt from the surface of the water. So I think roofs should actually be designed to be reflective. Um, I think there's an opportunity there to eliminate cooling and also increase the amount of thermal energy we can collect in systems like this. So always try and find other ways to put these elements to productive use. 
Tim E, thermal expansion can also back out some of those screws if installed incorrectly. Absolutely, Tim. Uh, metal does expand and, co and contract, so you have to be really cautious with that. So Kona, next question, Lee here. How do you check if your asphalt shingles have fungicides? You know, Kona, that's a great question. And I, because I know you're calling from Calgary, the chances that they have a fungicide is pretty low just because we have a pretty dry environment. But um, probably the easiest thing to do, and there's no guarantee this is going to work, is to go up on the roof and remove one of the shingles or look underneath it if you can, which you may not be able to. Uh, and there, there should be some sort of writing on it um, to indicate what kind of shingle it is. The other thing you could do is, is if you know the roofer that put those shingles on your house, you can look to see if, uh, or, or call that roofer up, I should say, <clears throat> excuse me, and see if he remembers the brand of shingle that he used. Uh, you gotta be really cautious with it. Now, I do harvest rain off of an asphalt shingle roof here in Calgary, um, and I have not had any issues with it, but if you can avoid it, I'd recommend it. I don't really think that we should be using asphalt shingles on our houses. I think they're a disposable product. Um, they're generally not, um, of, you know, I mean, the quality is fine, but um, I think that we should be trying to put building materials onto our buildings that will last forever. And furthermore, if they are going to be taken off, they should be at least recyclable. Um, now, asphalt shingles are recyclable to a point. I know that they melt them down and they turn them into roads. Um, but um, I'm just generally not a really big fan of asphalt if you can avoid it. One thing I'll say about uh, hydrocarbons that may come off some of these asphalt shingles is that hydrocarbons themselves are actually very, very easy for soil to uh, uh, break down. Um, Paul Stamitz has shown this with his research around fungi. And so if you're putting rainwater into systems that might have some of these hydrocarbons in it, we know for a fact that properly built gardens with um, the right fungal structures in there should be totally fine um, with any hydrocarbons coming off of these roofs. Okay, Lee asks, um, how would you check if, uh, sorry, I already answered that question. Um, okay, thanks. Put on a few years ago before I knew about all this stuff. Well, if you know about, uh, if you know what the, what the roofer was that put it on, you could ask him, like I said, um, what kind of brand or if those shingles actually had uh, fungicides in them. So something to think about. While we're, um, while, we're, while I'm waiting here for more questions, um, I'm going to bring up a YouTube video that I did not that long ago uh, that shows another unique way of using a roof uh, and, and stacking elements. Um, so let me just go. So in this YouTube video that you guys can watch, I actually converted a ready to move building. So a portable or sometimes people call them trailers. Some people call them mobile homes. And I extracted, I designed a system to extract thermal energy out of the attic. And I'll do a YouTube video about this at some point in the future. Um, so basically instead of just blowing the air out of the attic, um, I, I built a fan into the house and I suck that air down underneath into the crawl space and then I store the energy underground. And it's been really interesting to watch the effects. The, the ground underneath this house will get as hot as 25, 26 degrees Celsius through the summertime. And the thing is, is that we're not using any extra energy to do it because typically houses have fans on them anyways. They just exhaust the air outside. So instead of just exhausting the air to the atmosphere, we thought we would try and put that energy to productive use. And so we use the hot air in the attic. And what's really interesting is that the attic actually gets to 60 to 70 degrees Celsius uh, all summer long through the day. And so there's enormous amounts of energy in that air that we're then storing underground in an insulated, what's called an annualized geosolar system. So while this is not necessarily about rain, uh, it is about uh, how to stack functions within existing systems on your property. Uh, Frankie, curious, would you like to know how come, I would like to know how come you and Michelle uh, chose an urban head homestead as opposed to going off grid? Great question, Frankie. Um, so I'll give you guys a little bit of background on this. So Michelle and I are both mechanical engineers and we quit our jobs uh, almost 10 years ago now, more than, yeah, 10 years ago now, and to travel the world. And as a result of that, we, um, 
we made sure that we had at least two years of income in our bank account. Um, and when we came back from traveling, because we didn't have jobs anymore, we chose to do all sorts of things to try and save money. And so one of the things we did is we house sat. So we lived in other people's homes for a really long period of time. I can't remember if it was six months or even a whole year. So people actually paid us sometimes to watch over their houses. Um, we started growing our own food. We generally, because we were building a new business and we didn't want to have the um, expenditure of a mortgage, we chose to live really inexpensively, which has ended up being a really good option for us. Um, and then we decided to have kids, which decided to multiply. And uh, we had two wonderful little children, Rowan and Naomi. And um, we kept getting asked all these questions from people or, or getting opportunities to go live in eco villages, which we didn't really jive with. And so um, we ended up kind of forming our own little intentional community or eco village uh, with Michelle's mother-in-law. And she lives here in Calgary. And it's been incredible for our kids. It's been incredible for our marriage just because Michelle and I actually get to go on dates. Um, and so we basically took advantage of the resources and we partnered with Michelle's mom um, to retrofit this property. And in addition to that, you know, most people live in urban environments right now. And so this has been really great from the perspective of demonstrating how much you can do on a really small space. Having said all that, we have aspirations for um, larger properties, but we're just waiting until the time is right for us to make that move. And we're thinking it's probably going to be this year, but it's really tough to know exactly when uh, we're going to get the right piece of property and the right opportunity. One of the things that um, we did was um, we built something called a holistic context, which is a decision-making tool that I highly recommend that you guys all uh, go and do, actually. It's totally off the um, topic of rainwater harvesting, but Javin, who mentioned, uh, made a comment here recently, specializes in helping people to make good decisions. Uh, he's a permaculture practitioner. He's a co-teacher who teaches with us. Um, Javin and I run a program called Regenerative Business Mentorship. He's an incredible guy. He has a website. I'll put it up here right now um, called All Points Design. And uh, he runs programs that uh, help people to build these holistic contexts. And it's probably one of the most effective ways of making decisions. And so when Michelle and I have an opportunity like moving rural or buying a farm or changing the course of our company, we run it through our holistic context. And so a holistic context, we can do an entire show. In fact, I'll probably bring Javin on uh, one of these shows here and he can talk about holistic context with me. Um, we use it in our consulting practice, um, but he's really innovated in this space in really unique ways. And so uh, in one of the future shows, we'll make sure that we bring him on to talk about some of his insights around holistic context. And so basically the, the long and the short of it, Frankie, is that we have not found the right opportunity that uh, matches with our holistic context to move out of our current situation right now. And so we just continue to innovate on an urban uh, scale. Um, Sabian, yeah, you're right. A lot of trailers don't have attics, but this is a new thing. And a lot of new homes now are being built like this because banks like them. They like to buy prefabricated homes in factories. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot more of them and a lot more of them are actually uh, being built with attics. So some of them have them, some of them don't. Frankie, no, I'm not referring to Dakota. I'm referring to Javin. So his website is there, All Points Design. Okay, guys, so we've got 15 minutes left. I can take a couple more questions, or if uh, we're all questioned out, we can also call it an early session as well. Um, hopefully you got some insight around rainwater harvesting, and it's helped you to think a little bit more about um, how to effectively harvest rainwater and some of the considerations that you need to take in order to do this effectively. I'll just bring up the anatomy of a rain tank infographic again. And if you guys have any questions about rainwater, um, we can definitely go through there. I'll just let you know that I've got some additional resources here at the bottom of the uh, infographic that you guys are able to download. 
Um, while I'm waiting for your questions, again, I'm just going to ask again to uh, hit the like button if you found this valuable and interesting. Um, and we will um, continue to wait for questions. Josh asks one, how could you treat water if roofing system is not ideal? That's a great question, Josh. Um, it's really going to depend on what you're trying to remove from the roof. So, uh, in fact, why don't I draw a little bit of a, a typical treatment train that I would use in a rainwater harvesting system that might be effective for you guys. The question was, how do I filter water? And so if you've got rainwater coming in, there are several different types of filters that you want to run your rainwater through if you intend on drinking it. Uh, number one, pretty much every system is going to have what's called a bulk filtration system. Okay, and so this is going to be called a bulk filter. And definitely, um, generally speaking, what I do is I recommend using a filter that has what's called a variable gradient. Okay, and so this can be between 20 to 5 micron. So what this is saying is that as the water moves through the filter medium, it takes out 20 on the outside and it takes out 5 on the inside. So it finishes at 5, but it starts at 20. So instead of having a 20 micron and then a 5 micron filter, you can do it all in one unit. This is going to take out all the particulate, which is really important. The next filter that I would generally run it through if I'm going to be using a potable system is something called a candle filter. And this is similar to what you would find in, in MSR water filters typically used for camping. And so they're made out of ceramic. Okay, and these guys will go down to a half of a micron. So this will actually filter out all of the bacteria in the water. It won't get viruses, but it will get bacteria. Next, we use a carbon filter. And this takes out taste and odor, but it will also take out the um, herbicides and pesticides. So it really helps to clean up the, the water source. It won't do heavy metals though. And then lastly, we would run it through a UV light. Now, if you do suspect that you have heavy metals in there, you can then run the water through one more filter which would typically happen at a sink that you're going to drink out of. And this filter has to have KDF media in it. That's one option. The other option could be RO, which stands for reverse osmosis. Okay, so those are two options. And those will take out any heavy metals or any last remaining things that you might be worried about. Now, you may not want to run all of your rainwater through these filters. For example, if you're using it to flush toilets, you might actually have a slipstream of water coming off right here, which goes to your toilet system. Because why would you want to run water through all of these filters, which have a limited lifespan, if you're just using it to flush sewage, right? Um, you may also choose to have other slipstreams that go to other locations. So you might run um, all your water through showers. Your showers might come through here, but it might also come through here. If your hot water tank is hot enough, you may not need to run it through the UV light. So you can decide where water is going to come off of the filter system depending on where um, and what you're going to be using that water for. And as we discussed in the session today, what we've learned from some of the work that Peter Coombs has done is that the rain tank itself is actually a supplementary treatment system and that the biofilms that form on the inside of these tanks as well as the sludge layer is actually one of the most effective ways to remove the heavy metals and some of the toxins that exist within the rainwater system. So this would be the type of rain system 
or filter system that I would use on a rainwater harvesting system. Hopefully you found that uh, interesting. Um, okay, Daniel Howell, thanks Rob. Suggestions on suppliers of rain barrels in Calgary, square or rectangular shapes are preferred. So Daniel, there are a couple people out here that do sell them. Um, you gotta be really careful with the ones that you take because they can end up having all sorts of toxic material in there. So make sure that you're doing your due diligence. Um, Western Canadian Containers is a company that actually sells them brand new if you wanna get them from brand new. Uh, there is a guy in the Southeast that sells them off his front lawn. And I think he's, he's making a killing um, on them because I think he picks them up for free. Um, so there are places in Calgary that you can get them. Just make sure that they've had potable materials or food grade materials in the actual containers themselves. Hi from Transylvania. Do you need pressure for 0.5 micron filters and all and the filters? Yes, absolutely. So if you're um, using a half a micron filter, you're gonna need to have a pump to push it through, um, definitely. And there's lots of different types of pumps that you can use. Um, depending on what type of a system that you intend on trying to design. All right, guys. Well, if we're running out of questions, um, I just want to say thanks to everybody uh, for showing up tonight. If um, you found this interesting, I'm just going to ask one more time to hit the like button. Um, and we'll just close out with a couple of uh, little bits of info here. Just pulling it up. If you'd like to get uh, more information, you can um, get onto our website at vergepermaculture.ca. You can also uh, sign up for our newsletter if you're uh, new to Verge Permaculture. So if you go to vergepermaculture.ca, you can uh, sign up to our newsletter list. I send an email out to folks uh, once in a while. And... Um, I give updates on what we're gonna do live on YouTube, as well as all sorts of uh, free info. Um, if you're interested in this type of information, we offer permaculture design courses right through Western Canada. And we also have online programs like the Regenerative Business Mentorship, as well as uh, Permaculture Pro, which is going to be a select group of people in a webinar type setting, which will be coming up here soon. You can find all of that on our website. Hopefully you found this super interesting and I look forward to seeing you guys on Monday. We'll be doing another live webinar on a topic to be determined. Okay, have a great weekend, everyone.